I know I stand between you and uh, the end of your day, so uh, um, got the coveted end, end spot uh, after two very, very good speakers here. So, um, yeah, please absolutely grab some food and another drink, and uh, we'll, uh, we'll get started here. So, uh, my name's Bimo Mehta. I've, uh, I think, how many of you actually get the Daily Old Bulletin? Or, so, so, few of you do. Um, how many of you have been to our website, jwnenergy.com? A few of you have done that as well, a few more. So we've been in the industry about 80, 85 years. We've been part of the Canadian oil and gas industry pretty much from its onset. Uh, JWN is the June Warren Nichols Energy Group. You would have remembered Oil Week magazine or an Oil Sands Review. The Daily Oil Bulletin and JWN Energy are our two big ways to reach the market. We serve the producers, the pipelines, the services industries, the governments, the regulators, and uh, spend a lot of our time, in, in many ways it's both a media business, um, you know, news, advertising, that kind of thing, as well as a data and intelligence business. Over the last couple of years, we've kind of expanded our footprint into data and intelligence. Uh, CanOils is a database that kind of covers all of the projects. Some of your organizations may be using it for research, understand what's happening. And then Evaluate Energy is a company that we bought out of the United Kingdom about four years ago, which does global intelligence. And uh, we now serve a whole range of clients all over the world. We, uh, you know, the ones that you would expect here in Canada, like the Suncors and Synovus, 100% of the oil companies use our service. But we now kind of are serving a whole range of people with data, like the U.S. government and OPEC and you know, we, we did a study for OPEC a few years ago when they wanted to know whether the U.S. shale phenomenon was real, and the answer was yes. And uh, and you know, and we kind of helped them with understanding the costs and what's happening with deals and mergers and acquisition activity globally. And it's given us a nice insight not into just what's happening in Canada, but also what's happening around the world. Um, before I get into my presentation, though, I, I did want to give you an open invitation. This is uh, an, an, an event that doesn't cost you anything, but it's one of the various stakeholder groups we serve. So one of the groups that we do a lot of work with is the oil field services industry in Canada. Uh, we have a phenomenal technology sector in the country as well as the services industry because what's interesting about the Western Canadian sedimentary basin is you've got every kind of resource available. If you think about shale, we've got it. If you think about oil sands, we've got it. You know, aging fields that have been in operation for 30, 40, 50 years sometimes, and now we just need to squeeze a little bit more. We've got that too. We've got the technology. So what we did through this recession is we actually partnered with the Petroleum Services Association of Canada, Export Development Canada, Government of Alberta, and the Canadian Global Exploration Forum, which is companies in Canada whose head office in Canada, but they're drilling for oil somewhere else in the world, and we're doing a series of workshops and reports to help the oil field services industry in Canada find new markets, new places to do business. Uh, we're great in our own market, but we're a little less great at getting outside. And so as a part of this group, there are you know, lawyers that are focused on global markets. This may be a great place to meet people, potentially meet clients, and um, a good way to engage with, with your market. So uh, again, open invitation, come join us. That's the launch event, and then there'll be a whole range of resources online as we try to help our you know, Canadian companies look at global markets. So, and if you just go to our website down here, you'll be able to find the link and then register yourself for the event. So let me get into my presentation. So Racine kind of did a great job opening this up and talking about moving to 8 billion people and resources. And there's no question that we are going to be seeing an increasing demand for energy. If you look at the world of, you know, who uses energy like us, you're talking about a million, a billion and a half of people. Canadians, Americans, Europeans, generally the OECD countries. China, despite its massive growth, still uses energy at one quarter the intensity that we do in Canada. Sorry, back of my head here. One quarter the, one quarter of the intensity of uh, what we see around in Canada. India, 120th. Uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, if you take out uh, South Africa, you're probably in the 135th range. 
Um, and if any of you have traveled to these countries, you, you know what that looks like. Um, as people, and, and you also got to realize that as people get richer, they start to expect things, they expect to have a better life. Um, and a better life often means things that we take for granted. You know, we have heat. People in many of these countries need air conditioning. Or owning their first car or travel. And that intensity of usage shows up in every forecast. And this is a forecast done by BP, but, you know, EIA, World Bank, UN. There's a whole range of forecasters and private forecasters. And they're all pointing to one thing, greater and greater energy use. Uh, for your buildings, which are heat and light, for non-combustion, which is plastics, industry, transportation, and across the board. You can see in the graph there, the green line is usage in countries like ours, and you can see all of the forecast growth in energy is coming from China, India, other Asian countries, Africa, and then other countries in general. So, well, one thing that we know for certain, as the world gets richer, they're going to want to use more energy. That's all we know, and you know, my, I had the tough role of talking about okay, what do forecast? What what is the forecast? Look like? And what was really interesting is if you go back four, five, six years, everyone would put out their forecast, but they generally put out one set of numbers. You get smart people in the room that would sit down, look at all the data, make some solid assumptions, and then forecast what the future looks like. Um, about two, three years ago. You know, as we started reporting things, we're realizing that more and more people didn't want to stick their neck out. And you saw more and more people laying out what you would call scenario analysis. So BP, for the first time ever, when it was doing its annual study, decided, we're just going to show a bunch of people a whole bunch of scenarios. Now I'm going to come over here and show you what these scenarios look like. They built a whole series of views of the world. This is what the world looked like in 2016. Oil, gas, coal, nuclear, hydro, renewables. What does it look if we're just transitioning? What does it look like if we're going to ban the internal combustion engine? What does it look like if we do a little bit less gas switching? What do we do if we push renewables faster? What happens if we really pull out the big hammer and shut down coal? And what happens if we pull out, pull out an even bigger hammer and move people along? Um, and what's the mix of energy? And as you can see with this, is the big orange bar of renewables gets bigger as you pull out a bigger hammer. Um, uh, the speed at which gas takes over, it grows, but then it shrinks again as renewables take over. But it all points to a, a whole series of scenarios where you're sitting here today and you're saying, okay, are we going to be 20% higher in the future? Are we going to be, you know, 50% of our energy, and, and nobody really knows. Um, and I think one of the things I want to leave you with is just the sheer level of uncertainty we're dealing with, and what that means for all of you as opportunity. Um, so, again, uh, the U.S. government, the Energy Information Agency, uh, we, we provide them a lot of our data as well. And they did some work, uh, we didn't do the work, but they, they did some work around electricity generation from different fuels. And they said, okay, this is the world at a base scenario. And it's exactly the kind of stuff, I don't know if you used the same data. You did, did you? Yeah. That natural gas is taking off, renewables are taking off, and coal's kind of kind of coming to a bit of an end. And even they didn't want to stick their neck up. They decided, okay, let's give a few scenarios. This is what it looks like if, if it's um, harder to get hydrocarbons like gas, this is a world where, you know, gas continues to be really, really cheap because innovation isn't just happening on the solar side and on the power side. But the whole reason we ended up in this uh, recession in oil and gas is a massive amount of innovation hitting at the same time. We've never been more innovative than getting hydrocarbons out of the ground. And I think one of the reasons for the uncertainty is that if you're in a business whose livelihood depends on hydrocarbons, you're not going to take a competitive threat line down. And you're going to come out, and you're going to come out slinging, and you're going to come out fighting. And one part of fighting is innovating and finding new technologies and finding new resources. And uh, it's not a fight where it's a clear winner has yet been decided. I think this is the first time, I think one of the most interesting reasons why there's so many scenarios 
is this is probably the first time in about 50 years where it's unclear what our future energy world is going to look like. If you, were, if you roll back the clock to the end of World War II, we could forecast that the world was going to be powered with oil. In fact, if you are in the suit of history, um, you know, half the reason Churchill went on a lot of, uh, you know, he switched the whole British Navy to oil because he could see the situation with oil coming. It was, it was a much easier situation to forecast. Today, it's not so easy. You have a highly competitive hydrocarbon resource, you've got a highly competitive solar resource, you've got global climate change to worry about, and frankly, it's complicated. Um, so we've talked about solar, we've talked about gas production. Let's talk about what are the sources of uncertainty, because there's uncertainty around supply. First issue is cost competitiveness. Uh, renewables and hydrocarbons are becoming faster and cheaper, and people have talked about gas being a bridging fuel. But that's not even defined yet fully. You know, if you look at two or three companies that were heavily involved with, uh, with uh, you know, natural gas fueling stations, there's a company called Clean Energy Fuels. Um, you know, there's, uh, there's a few companies that produce engines based on natural gas. They've had horrible trajectories at their share prices. And a lot of the reason for that is their skepticism. They're wondering about, well, when you just jump over electricity? What happened? But yet, the question is there. Um, engineering challenges around storage. Uh, there are, you know, we're moving to a world of batteries, but storage has yet to be figured out. The, the, un the secret about storage is you lose, you lose energy every time you change it into something else. And it's an energy challenge you just can't deal with. So if you produce one unit of energy and you decide to put in a battery and then you decide to consume that bottle of energy, you've lost today roughly 40% of the energy. Just in the process of putting it into a battery and taking it out. And, um, you know, and that's one of the challenges is that if you decided to switch everyone over to batteries, you wouldn't need as much power as you use today. You'd actually need to have double the amount of power generated because you have to store it, you're going to lose it, and where is that lost energy going to go? Um, electricity is a geographically local product, whereas hydrocarbons travel on the roads. So what do you mean by local? Is that you're, the way electricity travels and how it loses efficiency as you travel along large power lines is that you'd never be in a situation where a big nuclear plant in Ontario could set lines right across the whole country and feed power to Alberta. It's too far, it's too expensive. Um, in fact, how many of you have been to Ontario and seen those massive giant power lines all over the place? You're you nodding your heads. The whole reason those lines exist is because they have a handful of small solar plants, oh, sorry, small nuclear plants, and in small geographic footprints, but they serve the whole province. And that electricity has to make it all the way around the province. And it's expensive and there's lots of losses. In a place like Alberta, because our power distribution is so much more spread out, we don't have those same kinds of lines. There's a few corridors like that, but we don't have anything near that because our power is actually spread out across the province closer to the sources of demand. And the problem that Racine talked about, about this transportation cost, it's beautiful, it's beautiful when you have a solar panel on your roof. But... Um, if you wanted to supply a whole city, solar, wind, power generation works really well. But that plant in Morocco he showed could never export their excess power to France because it's just far too expensive. But, you know, you can, you can sail an oil tanker into Morocco, fill it up with oil, and get it to France. And that inherent localness is one of the technical challenges that might in fact be insurmountable, just the nature of what power's like. The, the other area is regulatory complexity. Um, as much as we want to change, um, we've just seen with Kinder Morgan, Energy East, um, but we're also seeing it with the Site C Dam. That's about as green as you get, and yet environmentalists still don't like that. Um, as you start thinking about things like large 
infrastructure of any kind, you start moving down the path of NIMBYism, regulatory uncertainty, First Nations rights, and it opens up a tremendous amount of complexity that shouldn't be underestimated. Adding new supply, shifting supply, changing supply is, is going to be as complicated for a new solar plant as it is for wind. And we saw this actually in Ontario as they were trying to put solar, sorry, they were trying to put wind power on Lake Ontario. And uh, there was massive amounts of pushback. The other area of uncertainty is carbon pricing. And uh, what exactly happens? The higher the carbon price, the faster the transition to other forms of energy. But it's not clear. You have an election going on in Ontario right now, and on Thursday you could have a government in power that wants nothing to do with the carbon tax. We have an election a month. We have an election about a year and a half from now, roughly, in Alberta, where the most likely winner wants nothing to do with the carbon tax. Uh, there's our single largest trading partner that's eating our lunch in a whole series of economic ways wants nothing to do with the carbon tax, and it's not clear whether that going to change anytime soon. And so, but that, that will impact the trajectory upon which the supply changes and how the world changes. Um, and the last one I want to flag, which is uncertainty, is the whole area of geopolitics. And I could have used both politics and geopolitics here, just because, um, boy, there's a lot going on. Uh, let's talk about geopolitics. So you have an Iranian, uh, you have the U.S. and Iran getting into a, a bit of a fight, but it's very clear that India and China want nothing to do with this particular fight because they rely heavily on Iranian oil, and India's prime minister's already stated that it's a national security interest for him to ensure cheap and low-cost supplies of hydrocarbons. In fact, he's been on record to say India needs all types of energy, with one twentieth the consumption level of the Western world, they view any sort of view to restrict their use of hydrocarbons as akin to things like the salt tax from British India from about a, you know, 80 years ago. They view it as neo-imperialism, and they write about it every day if you open up an Indian newspaper. And uh, you know they, they view it as, well, you're rich, you're comfortable, and now you're holding me back from a better life. So it's not clear that everyone's aligned on objectives. Right now, both China and India's commitments on carbon is, we'll discuss reducing when we are as rich as you. And that part is often not discussed or, because they've made a commitment, and the commitment is, we'll, we'll step up once we're as rich as you. And oh, by the way, we're building these massive solar farms, where's yours? And they would, eat, they would very much look at Canadians and through that light of, you know, I wouldn't necessarily want to preach because um, they're at least building those solar plants to meet their energy needs. And so it is quite complicated how that's going to all play out. Um, the other reason I, I should have said both politics and geopolitics on supply is that um, there are jobs and people attached to these, these things. And as you shift people from certain kinds of jobs to others, you know, just take a look at truck drivers. Um, and that's more on my next slide, but I'll, I'll use this example here. What are you going to do when a million truck drivers look at, at unemployment? Are they going to take it lying down and just go to the unemployment line, or are they going to put up barriers? And a good example of a barrier is we have Uber here in Calgary, we have Uber in New York. You still can't get Uber in Vancouver. Why? Because the taxi drivers saw what was coming and they built barriers to prevent the adoption of Uber in those markets. And uh, we were very slow to get Uber because those same forces took hold within a Calgary that simply were not prepared in places like New York or London. And so, you know, I think the political dimensions will have a tremendous amount of impact on where we go and how quickly things move. So let's talk about sources of demand uncertainty. So, we have an electric vehicle boom, everyone loves Tesla. Uh, Tesla sold about 67,000 cars last year. That's three weeks of production of the F-150. 
and uh, not to mention all the other vehicles, but that's the number one vehicle. And, you know, I think Racine made a fantastic point, which is people would have said the same thing about the cell phone, and they did. But I think the key message I'm going to talk about here is just the level of uncertainty. I don't know the answer to that question. Um, I look at forecasts almost every day by a whole range of people. And what I do know is that hydrocarbons have now hit 100 million barrels a day of use. Um, when this recession started, it was at 96 million barrels a day. And uh, there, there was continuing robust growth in demand. And you look at markets like India, China, and all those places around the world that have 120th, 130th on a per capita basis, it doesn't take very much incremental use, an additional family buying a car, to start materially moving those numbers. Um, so it's unclear. We might peak out at a much higher level. Uh, the other area is installed base. Um, how many of you in your household own a car that's older than five years old? Okay, over well, half of you. Um, how many of you don't own a car at all? So we got two polar opposites here. There's a growing trend of no one wanting a car because we're moving to the sharing economy and you can always find a smart car, you can always find an Uber. And you have people here that are driving vehicles longer and longer. How many of you just as hands have been driving vehicles over 10 years old? Or have at least one in your household? How about a quarter of you? Yeah, so these vehicles, once they're purchased, you buy an F-150 in 2020, and it's still going to be on the road in 2035, driven by somebody somewhere. And you buy an F-150 in 2020, or you, you buy, you know, you have a 2040 ban in France on buying a vehicle. That last vehicle that hits the road in 2040 will be on the road till 2055, if it looks like the vehicles we drive today. And so these long tails create problems with forecasting. Or it could be just like our cell phones, and how many of you are still carrying a Motorola Razr? <laughs> uh, so, 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 you know, it, it, it could go fast, it could go slow. Um, I want you to go to a site, and not, net, right, not net right now, but <laughs> at some point, go to carbonfootprint.com. Because the other thing I want to talk about is one of the hardest things to predict is human behavior. And Carbon Footprint is a, is a fantastic resource. It allows you to sit down and say, what's my personal carbon footprint? Hydrocarbons are a story of demand, not supply. Everyone focuses on what has Suncor done and what is happening with this pipeline. But every day we make decisions that affect us. So, so here's a number for you, just to keep in mind. If you want to save the world and stay under two degrees uh, in terms of global growth, global temperature rise, we need to be down to two tons of carbon per person on Earth. And the average Canadian is somewhere in that 15 range. And I'll give you some examples of why. So growth in tourism. How many tons of carbon do you think it takes to go from here to London and back on a vacation? Ontario or England? <laughs> England. England. <laughs> 1.2. So you used up 60% on the vacation. One trip. Um, how much carbon do you BC loves its tourism industry. A one-week cruise out of Vancouver to watch the whales and back. What's your carbon footprint? <laughs> yeah, about that. So it's about uh, it's about six tons. Six tons of carbon for all those great ships that Oregon wants running and coming into uh, the port of Vancouver per person. So if you're on the oasis of the seas, that's the biggest boat in the world. That's at 4,000 passengers. One week cruise, that's, that's a heck of a lot of carbon. And we love our tourism. And tourism is growing at a rapid pace. If you go to any developing country in the world right now, China or India, you're, what, the one thing you'll notice very different is you're now, for the first time, heavily outnumbered by local tourists. You went to these countries 10, 15 years ago, they'd see a lot of us, and not a lot of, of the locals touring. And today, Locals want to see their own countries, they want to see other countries, and tourism is taking off. And there is no credible alternative for hydrocarbons in airplanes. There's electricity.
electricity, but airplanes are huge. Transformation in transportation. So we talked about self-driving cars and Uber. So today, if you want to go and work in the oil sands, and you have a job in the plant at Suncor, on, on Sunday night, you can kiss your family goodbye, get on the red arrow, and you'll arrive in Fort McMurray with a hundred of your best friends in that, in, that, in that bus the next morning ready for work. Or you can hop on a plane with about 150 of your best friends and get on a plane. What happens when you have your own self-driving car, you can lie down and wake up in the morning in a new city? And you could live here and not have to be on the bus and share it with you, or be on a plane. And it, you could actually see a tremendous increase in CO2 emissions by simply allowing people the freedom to be on their own vehicle. Um, how many people have stopped doing buses because they now have an Uber Calgary? Put up your hands if you can. But well, you have a decision should I take public transport or should I just hop in an Uber? How many of you have done that? I know I have. Um, E-commerce. The most efficient way to get a package to your home is to drive to Costco, fill it up with 250 bucks in your trunk, and bring it home. Yeah. And I can't go to Costco without two minutes. Two minutes? Okay. I'm almost done. I thought you saw them, but... Yeah. <laughs> uh, today, we'll hop on Amazon and you'll pay a truck and get one shirt. And it's... Amazon is the only retailer in North America that does report on target for the fact that it is. So these things all have tremendous impact. We don't know which way it's going to go. It could be every one of these vehicles is electric, and it may not be a problem at all. Or it could be a really bad scenario. Um, last slide, and then I think I'm done here. So what I wanted to state here is that where's the opportunity? The purpose of coming was really for me to say, what's the uncertain world look like? And, I think where the opportunity lies for all of you is that we're in a dynamic and uncertain world. Um, our company tracks global mergers and acquisitions activity. The bar of upstream oil and gas is every global exploration production deal that happened last year, about $150 billion. Global power deals, about $70 billion. Lots of geography in terms of where it happened. Way more power deals and green power deals in Europe way more oil and gas deals here in North America. Um, I, we believe that there's opportunity in all types of energy. I think that for you, you know, one of the things I have a great deal of respect for the legal profession is you're helping your clients through a tremendous amount of uncertainty and you're helping them manage risk. What we're seeing is international scope. Energy is a global business. There's growing deal activity, green energy deals, and uh, U.S. shale deals are the biggest parts of the pie here. Technology is offering new opportunities. Um, navigation of social license to operate. The new regulations, things like the Alberta Climate Change Plan, opens up a whole range of opportunities. And what that means for you is the world is moving into a much more uncertain place. The world is getting much more complicated. And they need professionals to help them navigate that complexity.